Hi, and welcome to What is New with State Authorization, WCET's State Authorization Network webcast. We have a lot of content to get through today and several speakers. As we go through, be sure to use the question box to pose your questions, and we also have a chat option. I don't know that we'll be able to get to all the questions today. I anticipate that we'll have quite a few. If that is the case, I'll be sure to pull out the questions and share those with the presenters. They'll provide written responses and get those back out to you. The webcast is being recorded, and we will share the link to the archive that PowerPoint and any other resources that are shared next week. You can also download the PowerPoint slides as well as a, a document that we'll get to later on during the presentation, which is the NC Sara application. So if you go to the handout pane, you'll see those two documents there and you're, you can download them. If you want to follow along via Twitter, the hashtag is WCETWebcast. And again, my name is Megan Raymond. I'm the, actually the Assistant Director here of Events and Programs at WCET. We'll do a brief welcome of our speakers. We'll do an update on Sarah, talk about the data requirements and how to do your institutional renewal, and then hopefully we have more than enough time for your question and answers. But do feel free to enter your questions as we go through. We'll get to all the questions toward the end of the presentation, but if there's a theme or a question that we really need to stop and address, we will certainly do so. We have a wonderful moderator today who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Marianne Boki, who's the senior associate at excuse me, senior associate at NCHIMS, and she's a key person regarding the state authorization network and all things state authorization. So I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Mary Ann. Megan, thank you. That was very sweet. I appreciate that. And welcome, everyone. Um, what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes uh, introducing our speakers and then we'll turn this over to them because I believe we just have an hour and as Megan said, we do want to have time for those questions at the end. Um, so our wonderful speakers who agreed to do this today, thank you so much. Let me just say a few words about them. First is Marshall Hill. He is the Executive Director of the National Council for State Authorization Reciprocity Agreements, otherwise known as NC Sara. Um, prior to assuming his NC Sara position in August of 2013, he served for eight years as the Executive Director of Nebraska's Coordinating Commission for Post-Secondary Education. Next we have Mary Larson. She is the Director of S. Sara for the Southern Regional Education Board, uh, otherwise known as SREB. Mary has worked at SREB since 1998 and oversees a number of programs that help students start or continue their education. Uh, and Lana Dueck, she is the executive director of the newly created Arizona Sarah Council. She has been in this position since October 2015. Prior to that, she worked at Rio Salado College. Um, and without further ado, I think I'm just going to jump right in here into uh, our presentation, which is entitled, What is New with Sarah? We're going to start with Mary Larson, and she's going to start with an update and um, kind of a general overview of what's going on with Sarah. So with that, Mary, please. Okay, I'll go ahead and um, say the magic words of next slide. And usually something happens here. Hmm. I'm trying. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Marshall and I are going to uh, both do this section, uh, but he's going to do the really hard hard stuff at the very at the end of this part. Uh, but I thought I would go ahead and do just a quick update on where we are with the states that are not yet SARA. That is generally where the focus is at this point because we now have uh, 40 states plus the District of Columbia. Uh, California uh, legislation will be reintroduced and they an it's anticipated that the earliest they'll be able to join will be late 2017. Connecticut uh, legislation has passed and they're working on the application and it's anticipated that they will be able to join sometime in 2016. Florida is working on their legislation and they hope to be able to join sometime in 2017. Uh, Kentucky, it's anticipated that they will submit an application in October with a January 1, 2017. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. 
with uh, an anticipated January 1, 2017 participation date. Massachusetts, uh, the governor has signed into law a bill that provides for a special commission to examine and make recommendations regarding entering into an interstate reciprocity agreement. And it's anticipated that they'll be joining Sarah uh, late 2017. New Jersey, it's anticipated fall 2016. New York, anticipated late 2016. Pennsylvania is anticipated to submit an application in October with a January 1st, 2017 participation date. Puerto Rico has decided to affiliate with SREB. Utah, uh, the application is being prepared and anticipate being approved by the WICHE Steering Committee meeting on Ju July 29th. And Wisconsin, um, the MEC steering committee has approved and it's expected that the MEC commission will approve their participation on August 15th when they meet. Next slide. And the next one. So as of, uh, as of today, we're actually a bit past this. Uh, we're at, I believe, 970 some odd institutions. Uh, and we're anxiously awaiting uh, institution number 1,000. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll wave the flags when that occurs. Uh, one other thing to say about the institutions uh, is that we're we're now having many institutions uh, renew, and institutions are renewing at just about a hundred percent rate. If we find that an institution doesn't appear to be renewing, uh, with a little more effort, we usually discover that that's a communications problem on campus. So virtually all institutions appear to be uh, renewing. Next slide. So, this, you want to do this one? Nope, go ahead. Uh, this just breaks down the uh, institutional membership by region. Uh, it's about what we would uh, expect. MEC uh, added its states uh, early, as did uh, uh, WICHE, and SREB is uh, rapidly, rapidly uh, going to pass them, I think, before too long. Next slide. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. The the participating institution size hasn't really changed a great deal as far as where the focus has been. The uh, you know almost half of the institutions that are participating are are have an FTE of less than 2,500. Um, the 36 is the middle group, as you can 36 percent is the middle group, and the 21 percent is greater than the 10,000. And those numbers have been fairly, those percentages have been fairly consistent uh, since the very beginning. Right. Uh, next slide. As has this one, uh, the largest percentage of uh, participating institutions are public institutions, just about two thirds of them. 30% are independent nonprofits, and 4% are for profit institutions. We have a provision for tribal colleges to join if they choose and meet requirements, but as at this point none have. Um, early on, some people said, well, Sarah is really all about making things easier for the for-profit schools, and obviously if that was our goal, we've, uh, we've not succeeded at that. Uh, but we do have uh, we do have a number of for-profit schools, but uh, only about four percent. Next. So um, Alex Harris uh, and I have been tossing a saying back and forth for quite a long time, and that's uh, we're way past all of the easy stuff. So we find ourselves dealing with a lot of detailed questions. Uh, many of them hypothetical. Well, how would Sarah deal with 
and then a description of, of, of very complicated uh, issues. A lot of questions about branch campuses, uh, a lot of questions about cross state line branch campuses. Uh, our way to approach these questions and issues is often to put together working groups which delve into the, uh, uh, the minutia, uh, make recommendations. Uh, we those often to the regional steering committees for their, their feedback. And then at, at some point, uh, I decide uh, what to do about them. Uh, if it is a clarification issue, uh, the board has delegated to me the authority to make those kinds of decisions and uh, policy updates. Uh, if it requires a change of policy, obviously the board handles that. Uh, the board meets twice per year, but has adopted as part of its bylaws uh, the ability to uh, to make decisions uh, via email. Uh, I don't like to do that uh, for things that, certainly for things that might be either controversial or uh, uh, or affect uh, a great number of institutions or states. Uh, but sometimes uh, that's a better alternative than having to wait six months. So uh, we have a couple of upcoming meetings in uh, September, I believe it's on the 19th and 20th, is that correct, Mary? For yes, state, it is. yes, for uh, we, we are inviting every Sarah state to send a representative to Chicago to, uh, to work on Sarah issues and uh, then the next uh, NC Sarah meeting is going to be in Washington DC uh, on October 20th, I believe, the day after the, uh, the President's Forum annual meeting. Uh, lastly, we're all waiting with bated breath about uh, the U.S. Department of Ed's release of some additional rules on uh, uh, cross-state distance education authorization. Uh, I had heard last week that they were to be released on Thursday, then on Friday. Uh, they were not released on Monday. I haven't checked in the last couple of hours, but to my knowledge, they haven't been uh, released yet. Uh, none of us really know what those will say, but, uh, but stay tuned. Last thing I'll mention is... Uh, uh, there's been a lot of attention lately to uh, the accreditor ACICS, uh, the determination as to whether they will continue to be recognized by the U.S. Department of Education has not yet been made by, uh, by the Secretary. Uh, when he does, there, uh, there is built into the system and process a uh, uh, a time period, 18 months, which will allow uh, ACICS institutions to seek other accreditors. That is, if ACICS does indeed lose uh, its recognition from the secretary. Uh, but uh, this will all take quite some time to wind out. There are not a, a large number of SARA institutions accredited by ACICS. Um, I think uh, somewhere around 20, 15 to 20, uh, but uh, we'll be watching that closely. Uh, Mary, anything to add from you on this? Nope, I, I think you covered everything well, and if there's anything we didn't cover, um, just uh, every, everybody can leave a question in the chat room or just reach out to us. Mary, this is Megan. I just want to jump in. We had some issues with the audio, so your first couple of slides, if we could just run over those again, I think that would be very helpful to the audience. Sure. Um, I'll go ahead and do an update on where we are with the non Sarah states, um, and I'll just run through them alphabetically. California uh, legislation will be reintroduced at this session with an anticipated late 2017. 
Connecticut, legislation has passed. They're working on their application. And NEBI anticipates a fall 2016 approval. Florida is working on developing a, a SARA portal entity. They hope to pre-file legislation, and they hope to be participating sometime towards the latter half of June of 2017. Kentucky anticipates submitting a SARA application in October with a January 1, 2017 participation date. Uh, Pennsylvania is affiliating with SRAB, and they have the same uh, time frame of October and January 1 effective dates. Massachusetts, the governor has signed into law a bill that provides for a special commission to examine and make recommendations regarding entering into an interstate reciprocity agreement. Uh, it's anticipated that they'll be participating in SARA late 2017. New Jersey and New York, our NEBI anticipates they'll be anticipating late 2016. Puerto Rico uh, is anticipated to affiliate with SREB. Utah, uh, they anticipate being approved by the WICHE Steering Committee meeting uh, committee at the meeting on July 29th. And Wisconsin, next steering committee has approved the application and the commission it's on the agenda for the commission meeting of August 15th. Uh, next slide. And this was just a summary of where we are with the states right now of 40, uh, 40 states plus District of Columbia. And then next slide was Marshalls and I think we might have been good to go by then. Yes, thank you. So I will jump back to Marshall's slide here. Uh, this is something that we have recently released, Jennifer Shannon together uh, for us. It's all uh, from Jennifer. Uh, I, it might even be on our website, I'm not sure. Uh, you notice it does say version 1.0. This is designed to be helpful to state portal uh, agent uh, staff. And if you have suggestions for improvements, please please send them to Jennifer. Great, thank you so much. So now we'll move over to Lana, who will give us the SARA data requirements and SARA institutional renewal overview. Lana, your audio isn't coming through. Let's try that again because everyone can hear me now. Loud and clear. All right. Second time's a charm. All right. Thank you, Megan. And uh, I just wanted to start by saying thank you to Cheryl and Marianne for inviting me and also to NC Sarah. But I did want to make it really clear um, because I am the director for the Arizona Sarah Council that I am not an NC Sarah staff member. And so they've graciously um, allowed me to present today, but um, anything that I say is my own thoughts or opinions. So Marshall, Mary, please feel free to step in if I um, misquote or or if you want to add some clarifications to what I'm saying. So uh, um, with... I will be very surprised. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Marshall. I appreciate that. Um, all right, let's go ahead and jump into um, SARA data uh, reporting requirements. We get the fun topic of um, data, which is actually something that I really enjoy talking about. We can get through kind of the nuances of what the requirements are. As you know, as participating SARA institutions, uh, you have some reporting requirements. Some of them are um, in relation to complaints and the others are in relation to uh, your enrollment. And so today we're going to be talking about the enrollment. Sarah has, um, in, uh, I believe, in its wisdom and simplicity, has chosen to align its reporting requirements with um, IPEDS reporting requirements, and that um, has really streamlined the process, I think, for institutions. They've also aligned the reporting to happen one month after iPads reporting, so iPads is usually set for early April. 
And um, this year, the reporting requirements for Sarah came out or were due in May. And we anticipate that that would be the process moving forward, um, as long as IPEDS doesn't change their fall reporting deadlines. All right, next slide. The actual reporting requirements are um, to report the number of students enrolled in the institution via distance education delivered outside the home state and disaggregated by state, territory, or district in which the students reside. Now the institutions can use the means that they are currently using to determine the student's location. And um, there's a lot that we can unpack in that statement, but we're going to get there in the next section of this presentation. I know when I spoke to institutions in Arizona, there were lots of questions about how do we gather this information? And what Sarah has consistently said is that however you are currently gathering this information to report to IPEDS is the exact same way that they would anticipate that you report it for, uh, for Sarah. And then, uh, as always, for protection uh, situations, if there are fewer than 10 enrollments in a state, then you would just go ahead and report zero for that state. Next slide. For non-SARA states, you will be um, entering the distance education enrollment for each of the non-SARA states. And NC SARA will report those numbers as an aggregate. But the reason that they want them to be reported to SARA um, and by the individual states is because as new SARA states come on board, which since we just heard from Mary, we know that we're going to be seeing a lot more states coming on board, they will go ahead and release those numbers as the states come on board. And if we go through the next couple of slides, just really quickly, if you have already done this um, and you are a SARA uh, institution, then you've already seen these screenshots. And if you haven't, this gives you an idea of what uh, SARA has done for you to enter this information. I wanted to include this so you guys could see that it's a really straightforward process. And after this was all said and done, I went ahead and talked to several of my institutions here um, in my state, and I asked them for their feedback on this process, because we know that data reporting can often be a headache for a lot of institutions. So I wanted to see how well did Sarah do in their user interface and their instructions, and really um, in, in the, the user friendliness of this data reporting. So what I got back from my institutions and um, what I would assume would be the experience out there. But if not, please feel free to go ahead and put that, because I know Sarah is always looking for feedback, um, that the user interface was really friendly. And you can see that from the slide that we have up right now. The instructions were phenomenally clear, very easy to follow. And that the time required to complete this was very minimal. What I asked. Um, so is what are some of the best practices moving forward? And uh, they all said that it really worked out well to bring this information to their uh, reporting teams at the institutions. And they just aligned it right in with their iPads. So they had it ready to go right when their iPads information was ready to go. So when Sarah asked for it, it was just a matter of them going in and inputting the information. OK, next slide. Perfect. All right, so I said that we'll get to um, talking a little bit more about how your institution reports this information. And this is the part of data information that I really like to talk about. Actually reporting the numbers <laughs> um, you know, can be pretty straightforward. But how do we get those numbers is a completely different conversation. And uh, we could have all sorts of really interesting philosophical conversations. Unfortunately, uh, in this format, it's just me. But um, hopefully, you can resonate to some of the things that I'll be talking about as we move forward in this conversation. And the first thing that I really wanted to highlight is your institutional reporting is only as good as your data input. And so um, our institutional research departments and institutional research team teams can only do what they can do with information that we've already put in. And as we know, for collecting students' information, specifically their addresses, we as institutions have many points of entry for collecting that data. Not only do we have different points of entry in, in terms of different documents and forms uh, that they would fill out, but we also actually have different data points that we could be collecting. 
I put just a couple up here in terms of your FAFSA, mailing address, permanent address to give as examples, but I think all of you out there could probably list off three more that your institutions may be collecting on students. So it really becomes an, a question of how do we find our students when we actually start doing this reporting? We can go ahead and move on to the next slide. And I think there should be one more. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, the last graphic isn't popping up, and that's OK. Oh, there it is. It was slow, it was slow to pull. Uh, there's my, my good friend, Waldo. Um, I know as a child, this was one of my favorite games to play, was to always look for Waldo and see how quickly I could find him. Um, but we don't want to play that game with our students. And we certainly don't want our uh, reporting teams, our institutional research departments, to have to be playing that game. And so the question is, how do we find that one student and that one data point amongst all of the students and data points that we have? So I'm going to walk through what I consider to be my top five best practices. These are not the ultimate top five, but maybe you can pick something from here to streamline your process. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right. Uh, number one, define and identify physical presence data point in your data system. The first thing that I write there is define. Um, what's really important, I find, is to have a conversation at your institution before you identify the data point. We only know what we know, but if we bring in other people, such as the registrar, the financial aid director, advisors, everyone has a different interaction and a different mentality about who the student is and what's important to track. And so I find that having that conversation and really getting around what we're defining is very important. And then you also have buy-in. Once you've defined what the data point is going to be for your institution, then you need to actually move forward and identify it. Um, if we don't do that really important, a really important step in our data system, then we've had a really nice converse, conversation, a really nice philosophical conversation, which we like to do in education, but we haven't moved it forward actually in our reporting systems. So then we have that next step of actually identifying the data point. And before we move forward here, what I wanted to say really specifically is this conversation as far as uh, our data integrity, it very much applies to the data reporting for Sarah, but I've also taken a little bit of a higher perspective, and so everything I'm saying is not specifically for data reporting for the Sarah requirements, but this is more a data integrity conversation um, from a larger perspective. All right, we can move on to number two. Develop, um, I should say develop a report, sorry, with institutional research or the equivalent department. Make it official. And this is a one that I really, really like to um, talk about and have a conversation with my institution. I'm sure for those of you who are out there doing the reporting, you may have an Excel spreadsheet that you're tracking manually, you're speaking to an advisor that you know in that department, and they're helping you get students, however it is that you've gone through the back door. And I very much applaud those efforts because state authorization is not always on the forefront of every institution's top 10 list of things to get done. However, when it comes to reporting, we really need to elevate our reports and make them official. And there is an institutional research or equivalent department at your institution. If you're not already getting your information from that department, it would really behoove you. The reason for this, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in one of the next steps, is because we're laying the foundation for the eventual uh-oh situation a student got through, or there is an external audit. And so we really want to say that we've worked with the official department and not um, an Excel or some type of manual tracking that we've been doing on our own, even though that's our best effort. So really go the extra mile and try to get your report coming from the official data office in your institution. Number three. I'm oh, sorry. These are some tips. Um, when I look at reports, I'm sure that your institutions are very similar to ones that I've worked in. We don't want to create just one more report for a single use. And so when I was looking at how I would create a report for my institution, instead of just making it for the one thing that I needed, I really tried to look at what's the added value that I could add to this report so that administrators uh, could have buy-in to my need for the report, and it would also give more of a perspective on what's happening in the institution, not just state authorization. 
And so these are some data points that I've put together that could add value to a report that you may just need for yourself. So at the institutional level, we're looking at, and this is by, by state, headcount in a state, hours attempted, hours completed, tuition generated, and debt on that state. At the program level, headcount by declared program, headcount by awarded program. So we can really start to see who's progressing and who's actually moving through their programs at the, at the state level. And then at the course level, the course headcount. When you have all this information by state, now we're not just talking about reporting, but you're able to have really strategic and intelligent conversations at your institution about what's happening in your state and does it make sense to pursue more in that state or to dial back. Next slide, please. All right, number three. This is where you really need to become the Sherlock of your institution and a detective. And so we've already identified our data point in our student information system. But if you're like me, there's always someone in your institution who maybe doesn't follow all the protocols or who is out there doing something and they've been doing this for the last 30 years and why do they need to be reporting it now? What we want to do with this next level of the programmatic and activity-based survey is find those. And we're not finding them to, to report on them. We're finding them so that we have a real important and holistic perspective as what's happening at our institution state by state. And so what I've done, and I think I've shared a, a, a version of this with um, WCET Stan before, is created a survey that I can send out to my faculty, to deans, um, to internship coordinators, and they can help me find what we're doing out of state that wouldn't necessarily come up in the student information system. Specifically, um, some high profile examples would be uh, student teaching, clinical placements, internships, anything of that sort that may not readily be found in your, in your information system, this is where you want to survey so that you have that holistic perspective of every state. And we can move on to number four. Once you have the data point in your system and now you have the survey, you need to establish a review cycle to monitor and update. And we talked about before using the institutional research department and how what we're really doing is laying that foundation. You're doing that with the institutional research department to create an official report. And now here with our review cycle to monitor and update, we're also creating another layer of protection. So in state authorization, we know that the regulations change often. We know that our students move. And a review cycle helps you stay on top of those situations without having to update it on a daily basis and really getting you proactive of the situation instead of reactive. And so let's just say for an example, a, a student moves to a state where you don't have authorization. And at the same time, this is just a really bad week, you're going to have an audit by the Department of Education and they find this student in a state that you're not authorized. What you can do if you have a review cycle is say, the last time that this state was reviewed was X date and student moved after that date. The next time we would have reviewed would have been this date and we would have caught them at that time and brought them uh, into the fold. So you're trying to create layers of protection both for yourself and for the students um, so that you really know that you're on top of the situation. And we can move to our final one, number five communication. We are in our human nature are really great at creating plans and having meetings, but then sometimes we don't remember to tell all the impacted people exactly what it is that we are doing. And um, this can be the downfall of really any great plan. And so I say communicate proactively with students and internal stakeholders. And when I talk about this uh, data integrity element with um, with other institutions, I often get the communication with internal stakeholders, but I don't often get the um, communication with students. And so I'm just tracking with myself, excuse me. And so if we move to the next slide, I wanted to give you some examples of what exactly do I mean by communication. With your internal stakeholders, it would be really beneficial to them to have updates on federal and state regulations, to have SARE updates on new states and all the information that Mary just gave us. 
to have the information from uh, your IR report and your surveys. That is really valuable information I found at, at institutions for um, other departments for advising, for marketing, really uh, strategic information for them to be able to see what are the new avenues that are opening for the institution. And then um, internal policy changes and uh, uh, data tracking and reporting. So for instance, if you have a policy on a student and when they move from a state to another state, if there's a change made to that policy, really, really important information to communicate out. And finally, to students, uh, we want our students to know what our policies are. We want them to know uh, the importance of accurate data. Uh, and that importance one is really important because students often get hit a lot with uh, entering their information and uh, it can be a little bit redundant for students. So when we communicate proactively with them why we're doing this and how it's beneficial to them, they're going to be more apt to give us that up-to-date information. All right, we can move on to the next section. And this Mom, next section Lana? is... Yeah, absolutely. Lana, this, is, this is Mary Ann, sorry. Um, I actually have just two really quick questions to ask you, and I, I wanted to ask them while we were still talking about the data collections. Um, the first is, would you mind talking just a little bit about um, how and why Sarah is collecting um, information above 10, uh, and, and, and Marshall, feel free to jump in here too. There was just a question about um, why aren't we just putting all of our numbers in, into the data so that you have it? Why are we not doing it if it's under 10? Yeah, um, there's, there's really only one, one reason, and that was expressed concerns early on from people who believed that if institutions were saying that they had three students in the state of Wyoming, somebody could figure out who those three students were. Personally, I believe that, um, uh, that this is an unfounded concern, but we heard back from a number of institutions that they had a concern about that. There was discussion about whether it should be five or ten, uh, frankly, to lessen their concern, we settled on 10. I, I understand that, that, that in distance education people on campuses would like to be able to show their, uh, their institutions uh, large numbers of people that they are impacting around the country, and sometimes those large numbers are aggregates of a whole bunch of smaller numbers. But that, that was the reason. Uh, I don't know how well-founded it is, and we will take another look at that. Marshall, thank you. That's excellent. Um, and one last question uh, for you, Lana, before we move into your next slide. Um, and I know you, you touched on this a little bit, but I, I have a feeling other people are wondering about this besides the one question I got. And that is, um, sometimes the folks who are reporting for Sarah is not in the same unit that is reporting for iPads. And again, I know you spoke about working across campus, um, but I do hear that from folks a lot around the country. And I'm wondering if you could just say just a couple more words about what your advice um, would be to those folks. Absolutely. My advice is that if you are not the person who's generating the iPads report, uh, which I would assume would be a large number of people, uh, then this is the perfect opportunity to, to network across the institution. And um, I know that I said that early on and I just said it very quickly, but um, what I hear often when I speak to people doing this type of work, and by this type of work I mean state authorization Sarah work, is we find ourselves in silos. And because this work isn't always the, the highest of priority at, at institutions, people doing this work get very creative and very good at working in their silo and working around that silo. And so what I would say is that use this Sarah leverage. I think Sarah has really elevated the state authorization conversation. Your president or your chief financial, uh, chief academic officer has signed the Sarah application for your institution to participate, so they should know about this. Use that platform as leverage to really start building your network and to reach out to your IR department, to reach out to your IPEDS folks, 
give them a little bit of education as to what SARA is and how it benefits them and how if they can tack this reporting on at the beginning of their IPEDS reporting, how much easier it will be for both departments, you and them, when the reporting actually comes. Juana, thank you. That's excellent. Um, I know there are a few other questions here, but I'm going to hold those to the end because they're a little okay. bit more general. So, Lana, I'm going to give the mic back to you. Okay, so um, thank you. Institutional renewals. Uh, there's a lot of information on this slide, and NC Sarah has a great website that has all this information as well. So I'm not going to go through these piece by piece, but instead I'm going to speak kind of broad strokes about the uh, renewal process. And um, this is where I really bring in kind of my experience of being the portal agency for Sarah. So for the renewal period, it starts 90 days prior to the Sarah participation end date. So 90 days prior, as an institution, you're going to get an email from NC Sarah saying that your, in, your renewal is, is due in 90 days. But you don't get an exact date as to when it's due. And they're also going to tell you in that email that 30 days from the email, you have to give your institutional uh, renewal application to your portal agency. Um, so I highlight that because I like to work in in real dates <laughs> as opposed to the 90, 30 day, 60 day time frames. And if you know already right now what your participation end date is, you can map out for yourself what your 90 day, 60 day, and 30 day is going to look like. So for all of you out there who are in a renewal process or who are anticipating one, I would encourage you to, to do that because although you have 90 days, you really actually have 30 days from the time that you first hear from Sarah to get your application, your renewal application into your state portal agency. Um, Sarah has very graciously um, allowed for a grace period. Um, and if there are specific questions regarding that, I would direct them to, to Marshall. Um, but I know if you're in that situation and that's something you need to work through, they work through those on a case-by-case -case basis. So that's information that you can shoot to Marshall or also to Jennifer. Um, what I would say, just strictly my opinion, um, and I think people have probably heard me say this before if you've ever heard me speak, Sarah has really done um, a phenomenal job of being very proactive. I don't know a lot of the states when I was doing the state-by-state -state authorization process when I worked at the institution that proactively reached out at all, let alone as much as Sarah does to remind you of your renewal. Um, and so this is where I can get on my soapbox just a little bit for institutions since I was one. Um, there's really no reason for any of us to be late. Uh, and so really map those dates out for yourselves and make sure that you get them in on time to your portal agency so that they can move it forward to NC Sarah in a timely manner. And with that, I'm going to move over to our next slide. And we're going to walk through the actual renewal application. Um, this is one of the handouts that you received. Uh, Megan, do you want to walk them through how to access that? You bet. In the dashboard or the menu, Toward the bottom, you'll see a box for handouts, and it says Handouts 205. One of those is the actual application, and one of those is the PowerPoint slides. So you should be able to just click on that and download it. If you have any problems, just send a message through the question box. I'm going to give everyone just a moment to go ahead and open that up, and I would highly encourage you to open it up because I'm going to be talking a little bit about the application as we go through this. Um, but as I allow that moment to pass, what I will say is that when you receive that notification, NC Sarah sends you a direct link to this application. Um, I have received from some of my institutions at renewal time the original application to become a Sarah institution. And so my first um, point of advice is to make sure that you're completing the correct application. They look very, very similar, but the renewal one says renewal application right at the top. All right, so hopefully by now everyone has that renewal application open. Um, I said this before, this application is signed by your institution's president or by the chief academic officer. And that's really, really important. Um, if I receive an application that's not by the president or chief academic officer, and yes, I do go check, 
uh, then I return it back to the institution to have it signed by the president or the chief academic officer. This is, as I said before, when we talked with Marianne's question about um, networking across the institution, this is another great opportunity for you to network. Um, even if you don't get a, di a direct time with the president or your academic officer, you do have time on their calendar when they are signing this. Uh, a little bit of an email about context as to what this is. But this gives you either that email time or the face-to-face -face time to talk a little bit about your work and a little bit about what SARA is and what state authorization is and how this can really leverage the strategic movement of your institution. So take advantage of that. The next thing I'll say is that um, if you'll kindly do us a favor for those of us who are working through these applications, you'll see on the right hand side of the application there's a yes and no checkbox all the way down and right above it it says state. That's for the state portal agencies and I get a lot of applications um, that uh, the institution has gone ahead and marked all the yeses for us. So if you'd kindly just leave all of those blank and we'll work through those um, as we receive your applications. The next thing, and this is different from the initial application to become a SARA institution, is you'll see on page two, kind of right in the middle, one of the boxes says link to complaint system. And in here you're going to provide the URL to your institution's complaint system. <clears throat> now what I've seen when I've reviewed these are some really uh, nice complaint uh, processes. But what we're looking for is not only your complaint process, but one of the requirements and one of the things that SARA participating institutions agree to to become a SARA institution is that SARA does have the right um, or in students that are participating under SARA do have the right after they've gone through their institutional process, if they are not satisfied with that, they do have the right to appeal any non-instructional complaints to the SARA portal agency. So go ahead, if you haven't already taken the time to update your complaint process to include that appeal. And I know for a lot of my institutions, they wanted to see the exact policy um, for SARA. And if that's one of the questions, uh, I'm sure Marshall or Mary, but I also have it. I'd be happy to send that out. But um, I see a lot of these complaints that come in that aren't complete. So go ahead and have those uh, complaint uh, processes updated. And then the next one as we're scrolling through, um, you'll have the fees. And what I just want to say about the fees is that there are the two separate fees, potentially. If your state has an additional state fee beyond what, the, what NC Sarah has, uh, then you'll be sending in two separate fees. The state fees goes to your, to your state portal agency, and the NC Sarah fee goes directly to NC Sarah. Then in the last page of the renewal application, as you can see, there are only three pages. This is the page that um, allows for the state to have their specifics. As we just talked about, they'll list their fees if they have fees there, or if they have any additional bonding requirements or something like that, the state specifics will be here. What I will say is that because Sarah sends out a direct link, the state specifics might not be on this renewal, so go ahead and check with your state portal agency if you have uh, additional requirements from them. And then I already talked about the timeline and the timeliness to make sure that we all get these in on time. So I believe with that, that concludes my presentation. Lana, thank you so much. Um, Marshall and Mary, do you have any um, final comments before we go to questions? I have one. Uh, we are in the process of uh, processing <laughs> the um, enrollment reporting from institutions, the first cycle. Uh, and uh, there were lots of problems with it. Uh, we had 800 and some odd institutions that uh, reported numbers. 20 or so institutions reported nothing. Uh, but of the 800 or so institutions that did report, uh, over a third of them reported zeros across the board. Now, that, that doesn't make sense, and we need to do better than that. Uh, th there are legitimate reasons why an institution would report zeros in states. First being they actually don't have any students in a particular state. The second being that they have fewer than 10. 
but I'm talking about 35% of SARA institutions reported zeros in every state. Uh, we have got to do better. Uh, and uh, I don't think any of us thought the first round of data reporting would be stellar, but um, no, we, I didn't think it would be quite that bad. And uh, so clearly if an institution has no uh, idea where its students are, then uh, it's violating perhaps uh, state authorization requirements in, in multiple states. And we're going to work with our friends and colleagues at WCET and and other uh, other entities to to work with institutions to to have this next round be significantly better. Marshall, thank you. Um, and actually, I think I'm going to take uh, one of these first questions that came in the middle of our presentation before I kind of go back and scroll through the early ones because it's it's a great segue to this. Uh, and the question is this, do we include students doing internships or clinical placements in another state that are not in a distance education program for Sarah yes. reporting? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wonderful. Good. Um, and I'm going to go back just a little bit here. Um, Marshall, while I have you on, would you mind saying a few more words about the Chicago meeting? I think the audio was going in and out during that piece, and, and there were a few folks who were confused about what that was and who that was for. Yeah, last, uh, last year we gathered uh, all of the state portal agency staff, the principal person in every SARA state who uh, does the SARA work for the state. And we're going to do that again. That will be in uh, September. I believe the dates are 19th and 20th. We are sending out uh, invitations to the portal agency people in every SARA state or very soon to be SARA state. Uh, Marshall, this is Mary. Just um, because of the size of the meeting, you might want to uh, remind everybody it is limited to just one person from that SARA portal entity. Right. Th this is a uh, good example of this. There's no way to please everyone. Uh, but that's what we have decided to do in order to ensure that there uh, is sufficient opportunity for people to ask questions, talk with one another, and so forth. Excellent. And, and actually, we've had just kind of a flurry of activity going back to that first question that I asked you about non-distance education students who are taking a clinical or doing a rotation of some sort in another state. Maybe just talk for just a few more minutes, Marshall, about the reporting that you need to do for SARA from an institution that obviously is a SARA institution what kind of reporting do they need to do? I think there's some confusion about if they're SARA, they don't report it. So I don't want to say more than that and mess it up more, but just speak for a few more minutes about that. Sure. Um, we have from the beginning said that SARA was about distance education and not just online education. Uh, so uh, students do multiple things uh, away from their home campuses and they, they do them across state lines. And in many cases, those activities would trigger uh, physical presence in, in many states. And so uh, as part of our agreement with uh, state regulators, uh, during the development of SARA, uh, we, we agreed that we would collect that information and, uh, and report it in the, uh, in the aggregate. So yes, if your institution uh, places uh, psychology students in clinical rotations in hospital settings in another state, uh, we, we ask you to uh, report those. In most states, they would trigger physical presence uh, or in many states at least, uh, and a uh, certain amount of that activity is covered under SARA, so we ask you to report it. Excellent. Thank you. And for those of you who are asking a few more detailed questions about this, I will go ahead and um, work with Marshall to put a little statement together and get it out to everyone. But we're limited on time, and I want to get to a few other types of questions uh, just so we can, we can do that. Um, so going back to some of the earlier things that were talked about, Lana, 
um, and maybe you can speak to this and Marshall and Mary jump into. There was one question from someone who wanted to know, what do you do if your portal agency isn't being as responsive as you would like them to be? For example, she, she pointed out that in her, her state, it's taking up to 90 days to get responses for things. Um, any general advice for those folks? Give a heads up to the, uh, to, to the SARA director in the, at the regional level and they will uh, will nudge the state. Very good advice. And Lana, any thoughts about um, about being patient and understanding that people are still setting these processes up? Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, I, I was going to echo exactly what Marshall said, uh, to let your regional director know. Um, that is a uh, very, very sound advice. Sarah is small. There's only one portal agency for every state and the four regional directors. So um, they know all of their states and all their portal agency, uh, agency uh, leaders. And uh, as Marshall also did highlight, we are all meeting um, in September. So that would be a great time to discuss that. In terms of from the institutional perspective, um, Yes, patience and state authorization is is always key. Um, and for those of us who have heard, you know, these conversations before, developing that rapport with your with your regulator is very important. Um, unlike my situation, a lot of portal agency leaders also have their other responsibilities, so they're still trying to figure out exactly what does it mean to be Sarah and also do their other activities. So it's going to take a little bit of time for that to balance out. But this is definitely something that I have asked to be on the agenda at the September meeting for us portal agency leaders to talk about our communication processes so that we can get a little bit more on the same uh, playing field across states. Uh, this is Mary. One thing I would point out, in some of the states where there might be one there, there is going to be the state portal entity contact. All the decisions are made when the commission or a board meets. And if that board only meets three or four times a year, you won't get any kind of a decision until after that board meets. You should, be, you know, you should ideally should hear back from the state portal contact that, you know, the application has gone forward, but that until that board meets, there won't be a final decision made on your application. Excellent. Thank you. I think that was very helpful. Uh, Lana, this, this one might be for you. This is a question about the initial SARA application. The question is this. Does the state portal agency determine what analysis evidence is required for the interregional guidelines for the evaluation of distance education piece, or does SARA determine that? Okay. I'll be brief on this one since I am uh, aware of the time. Uh, and it's a Great question. We get this one a lot. These are um, meant to be provided to institutions as best practices. When you submit your application, your initial application, we are not anticipating seeing documents or other forms of evidence for all of um, the CREC guidelines, but we are asking that you are saying that you are uh, abiding by these sets of best practices. And in the event, after you've been approved, something comes to our attention, either at the state level or at the, at the national level, that uh, you are not abiding by these, that's when we would go back and ask for that evidence to show how it is that you are completing those guidelines. Excellent. Thank you. Very good. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I got one early on and I really wanted to touch on this. Uh, one of the um, participants wanted to know about Secretary of State. And I know we've talked about that on various other webcasts, but I think it's still a little murky for folks. Uh, Mary or Marshall, do you want to jump in and just talk about the role of Secretary of State in the realm of SARA? Yeah, you know, sec secretaries of state do whatever they do in all sorts of different ways, and SARA membership in SARA, participation in SARA by an institution, uh, does nothing to deal with any requirements of a secretary of state. So, if a secretary of state in a particular state says that all out-of-state entities doing business within the state need to register with that Secretary of State, then that's what you need to do. 
Yep, excellent. Very good. Uh, because it is important to remember that there are some activities that you'll all be doing as Sarah um, institutions that Sarah doesn't cover and that you will need to uh, take care of on your own. So I'm, I'm glad we got to that piece. I know we're we'll running... Oh, go ahead. Let me add just one more thing. Yeah. It, it, it would really be nice if we were able to take care of those kinds of things and maybe someday we will be able to. <laughs> But if we had not moved forward until we had every possible inconvenience uh, dealt with, uh, we, we would be nowhere. Right. I think that's right. Um, and I think we're all very grateful for how far Sarah has come and how many states we have on board and how many more are coming. We're running out of time, so I want to stop here and let people know that we will be looking at those questions that you wrote into the chat box, answering them and sending them out in a follow-up email. But um, as we come to the end of our presentation here, I want to have a heartfelt thank you to our three presenters. You've done a fantastic and wonderful job today answering questions and presenting some very timely and inf um, good information. Uh, folks' contact information is on this last slide. You can see it there. Otherwise, I'll say thank you so very much. And uh, again, we'll be in touch. Great. Thanks, everybody, and round of applause to Mary Ann. Thank you. Apologies for the audio delay. The webcast was being recorded, so everything that was mentioned in the beginning will be part of that recording. If you registered for the webcast, you will receive a link to the recording, and I'll also send it out to all registrants next week. So again, thank you, and we'll see you on the next state authorization webcast. Thank you, Megan. Fantastic job.